Thirty-three zero Delta, just a uh, cancel takeout clearance. That uh, looks like you're on taxiway path, sir. Imagine watching a wide-body aircraft like an A330 racing down a taxiway, getting ready to take off, and sounding that calm on the radio. I mean, I probably wouldn't have sounded that calm. Here's the entire video. Thirty-three zero Delta Heavy, traffic's on a one-three mile final. Wind two three zero at one zero, runway two two right at Whiskey, clear for takeoff. Uh, 33 Zero Delta, just uh, cancel takeout clearance. That uh, looks like you're on taxiway path, sir. Okay, this is the audio that got sent to me, and it is possible that when you hear the static noises, that's the pilots actually responding. This is this clip right here. It is possible that those are the pilots saying we're clear for takeoff on taxiway Papa. Not likely, but possible. And since we don't have the audio, we have no way to prove that that's not what was actually said. Now, I have no idea how you make this mistake, especially when you become an airline pilot. I have been confused when I was working on a, my private pilot license. I did get confused between a taxiway and a runway one time, and I actually confused my instructor so much, the instructor got mad about the whole situation. Anyways, it did happen to me when I was working on my private pilot license, but I'm gonna to explain to you why it's a little bit more strange to have it happen to you once you're an airline pilot. Look at this chart here. This is Newark, and I've flown here many times. Actually, one of my first vlogs I ever did was flying in and out of Newark. The pilot is right here at the Whiskey intersection, and air traffic control has given him clearance for the intersection takeoff. If you're not actually taking off from the full length of the runway, the controllers have to give you an intersection takeoff, which means that you have gotten the performance to take off at an intersection, not taking the entire runway length, which is at that airport in particular, very normal, same as like in Chicago, they often do an intersection takeoff. It's normal at a certain few different airports around the world. So when they give you that clearance, they're saying, hey, you're cleared to take off from this intersection, meaning you understand that you're not getting the entire runway length. So they are sitting right here at this Whiskey intersection, which means they need to make the very first right-hand turn once they move forward. And this is the clearance the pilot got. 33 Zero Delta Heavy, traffic's on a 1-3 mile final, wind 2 3 zero at one zero, runway 2-2 right at Whiskey, clear for takeoff. I should also mention that there was traffic coming in on a 13 mile final. To give you perspective, that is a long way out. If you watch the vlog that I had where I went to Japan, that traffic was very close and we were able to make it off of the correct runway at, during takeoff. So a 13 mile final is a long ways out. This is the audio from the vlog to show you just in perspective how close that traffic was when we were getting ready for takeoff. 8957 heavy traffic holding runways one, traffic three and a half out behind you, the one two six zero one zero runway two at right third takeoff. So that was three and a half miles out, so that's a lot closer. Still not crazy, but pretty close. So Basically, all you have to do when you're holding short of the runway, you're either gonna pull out and at the very first place you can go left or go right, that's the direction you're gonna turn and you blast out. That is a, a normal thing to have happen for years and years and years, so it's, it's strange to me how that can happen for that, plus a few other reasons. So they're right here and they passed up this 150 foot runway with lights on it and made it over here to this taxiway papa, which is definitely more narrow. And there's also one other major difference. This is what the lights look like on the side of a runway. And this is what the lights look like on the side of a taxiway. They're a little bit different. They do things like putting lights in different colors and barkings everywhere so that we don't get lost. But it's easy if you've never been to an airport, especially at night, it's easy to get confused. And what happened with me in my scenario is that we had landed, we were at a big airport or big for me at the time, and we had crossed a few different runways and got given to go down a taxiway. When we're going down that taxiway, there is a plane that's coming in to land. And the way that he is lined up looks like he is lined up directly at us. So now we are taxiing down this this taxiway, and I thought we were on the runway. And the way the plane was lined up with us, the the, the my instructor also looked out the window and was like, Oh man, they, they are, they're, they're gonna land right on us. And so we spin the plane around. So as soon as we spin the plane around, the controller in the tower goes, uh, y'all turned around, you need to go back the other direction. So then we realize at that point, the instructor goes, oh, the lights are blue. We are on a taxiway, we're not on a runway. And here's me, private pilot or soon to be private pilot, Kelsey, just like, oh, is that how it works? Like, I don't know, I didn't know what I was doing. So why are you listening to me? I don't know what's happening. Anyways, that pilot, I'm not 100% sure, but that pilot that was lined up on the taxiway may or may not have went to Canada.
Anyway, these Turkish pilots did actually end up getting on to Taxiway Papa. I'm not sure how they did it, but I'm surprised as how calm they, they sound when the controller tells them, hey, you're taking off from a taxiway. The, the pilots still believe that they're on the runway. Listen to their response to the controller when the controller tells them you're taking off from a taxiway. Now, despite some people's belief that the runways have some type of magical dust on it that allows your plane to take off, had the plane continued on that taxiway, they would have actually been able to take off fine. Not safe, but fine. And luckily, the controller caught this when the plane was only going about 90 knots, so they weren't going too fast. If that plane had, let's say, been going 140 knots, it would have been a lot more dangerous for the controller to actually say something. Because at that speed, they're doing a very high speed reject, a high speed abort, and something like that can result in, in people actually dying by them going off the taxiway at the end of the runway or to the side. There's a lot of things that can go wrong on a high speed reject. So if the plane were going that fast, the controller probably would have been better to be quiet. But since the plane was only going 90 knots, they were, controller, I, I'm sure wasn't analyzing that, but probably just saw them moving down the taxiway really fast and went, these guys aren't even on the right, aren't even on the runway. So they uh, rejected the takeoff. Had they been going faster though, probably would have been better to let them go. Either way, it worked out okay. Here's what happens next. And Turkey's 3 zero Delta Heavy, uh, you can uh, taxi at Papa and then turn right on Echo, hold short of runway 2-2 right. And Turkey 3 zero Delta Heavy traffic is on a five mile final, cross runway 2 2 right at Echo, then right on Bravo. And Turkey 3 zero Delta Heavy, uh, would you like to uh, taxi back to the runway to try it again? All right, Turkey 3 zero Delta, continue at Bravo and Romeo. I don't know why I like the way he says, you want, you want to go try that again? I don't know. I think it's funny the way he said that. So anyways, even though the pilots are stopped on the taxiway, they still think they're on the runway. Listen to what he says here. I'm not sure really where it triggered and everybody caught on to because once they're on that taxiway, Papa, they went down, made a right hand turn, saw all the markings to be on a runway, and I think maybe right there they realized, oh, that's the runway we're supposed to be on. We just turned right and we're facing it. So we obviously weren't taking off on that runway. And then they probably realized where they were. All of that being known, the, the pilot played it really cool. And he said this. Now I've talked about a lot of different mistakes that I made because I've made most of them. Um, taking off from a taxiway or landing on a taxiway, thankfully, are two that I've, I've never done and I hope I will never do. I find it a little bit strange how with all the different markings that are on there and usually you have pilots that are verifying, both pilots are verifying they're on the runway. There's a lot of different checks that happen once you get onto a runway. So I find it very strange that you can pass a wide lit runway, go a little bit further, get onto a taxiway where there's no markings and then go like, yep, we're ready to do this. And I'm not saying that I couldn't do it because I've made some mistakes where I thought I will never make that mistake. I've made that mistake before. So it just, it surprises me how that can happen. Now, the rumor is that they told the passengers they had to fix a maintenance issue, which in theory is true. And that's because when you do a rejected takeoff, the brakes get very hot. You can't do a takeoff again with hot brakes because then if you do need your brakes, they're gonna be mushy and you may not be able to stop in time and it's all the performance numbers are calculated based off of you being able to reject at a certain speed and that's based off of you having cool normal brakes. So that is true. And obviously at this point in these 40 minutes, I think that they spent on the ground before takeoff, nobody would have figured out everything that had happened and, and probably for the best because if you're sitting in the back of the plane thinking, okay, cool, we're about to take this long flight over an ocean and land in a different continent you're not going to feel really excited about your pilots when they just try to take off of a taxiway. You're, you're going to feel a little bit anxious during the entire flight. So probably best that they had, they told, they had told the passengers they had to fix a maintenance issue because it is true that it was a maintenance issue. The brakes needed to cool down and then they can continue their flight and not have any stress with any of the passengers in the back. I can assure you that the pilots that were up there, there was probably three, maybe four pilots. They're probably very focused the rest of the flight and talking about what are they going to do and what are they going to write in the reports of how they tried to take off from a taxiway because 
for sure that report went to somebody. American 383 Heavy stopping on the runway. Roger, Roger, fire. Do you see any smoke or fire? Yeah, fire off the right wing. Okay, send out the truck. Sending them. American 383, uh, can you give us any information right now? Uh, stand by. Chicago, American uh, 383, we're evacuating. American 383, Roger, trucks are on the way. 2A right is closed. 3 went on the airport can stop. By the way, the controller responded, I don't know if the controller saw the fire before the pilots noticed it or at the same time, but you can hear just how excited and startled he was based off of seeing fire coming out of the plane because he watches planes take off all day and that's, that's not something you normally see. Roger, Roger, fire. Having dealt with unplanned emergencies, I can tell you that these pilots did an amazing job because when you go through the simulator, you deal with emergencies all the time. However, in the real world, these machines are, are kept in a, a state where it's very, very rare to have a mechanical problem. So this situation of having engine fire while you're going down a taxiway is something that you would train for in the simulator. However, when you're doing a normal flight in a normal day, it's not something that you're used to having have happen. And these pilots sounded like on the radio, they handled it very well. They're stopping, they're, they're, they're saying, hey, we're stopping on the runway, which is something that you need to do so that way the controller knows not to land another plane there. And the reason you're gonna stop on the runway and not pull off is because you wanna to come to a stop as quickly as possible so that way you can start doing things like running checklists. Listen to when he makes his call back to the controller. American 3D3 heavy stopping on the runway. Now when the pilot makes that call, he all he has is an indication. He doesn't know that there's a fire out there. All he has is an indication on his plane saying, hey, there's a fire on your right engine. Now, he doesn't know if that's true or not true, but you're not gonna just assume, oh, that's probably not true, let's just go fly. No, you're gonna obviously reject and you're gonna stop right there on the runway. When he does that, he lets the controller know and that's why he made that call so they didn't land anybody behind them. That's when the controller said, yeah, we see a fire back there. So then the pilot knew, okay, send the trucks out, which is a, obviously was gonna happen either way, but that was the right call. It was a great um, command authority, as they say. He's saying, hey, get the trucks out here now. So the pilot is doing a great job having a great overall situational awareness, but listen to what the controller asked for here. American 383, uh, can you give us any information right now? Now I understand what the controller is trying to do here. They're trying to get additional information from the pilots in order they relay that information to the airport fire and rescue that is on the airport. So because they're now gearing up, so they wanna get as much information to them as possible. Here's the problem. The pilots are super loaded with a lot of different tasks. As soon as you have an, an aborted takeoff like this, you have a lot of checklists to do. You also have an engine that's on fire. You have to alert the flight attendant to bring them in the loop of what's going on. You have an evacuation checklist. You have to look for where is it safe for the passengers to get out because you have a couple hundred people that are on your plane and you can't take them out the right side of the plane, obviously, because you have a fire there. And on the left side, you could have an engine still running, so you, you can't really take people out the left side of the plane because if you go out the left side of the plane here, it's a lot harder to survive a fire when you end up in one of these engines and it's still running. Luckily, you had two, sounds like, very professional pilots that were able to communicate with the flight attendants to let them know what's going on, start running their checklist, and then they did something that was really key here, and they called and let air traffic control know they were evacuating the aircraft. Chicago, American, uh, 3 to 3, we're evacuating. Luckily, it sounds like there was two extremely professional pilots that are up there. Now, I'm not sure that that is a required call to advise air traffic control that you're having an evacuation. Some airlines may have that. I don't know if American has that or not. However, it's an important call to make because one, you have the airport fire and rescue. They're listening probably to the radio frequency, so it's good for them to know, but also air traffic control can let them know, hey, there's people that are now running around on the grass or on the runways or on the taxiways, which means you need to be aware that there's a bunch of people out there. You can imagine if you've been walking through an airport, people get lost trying to find their gate. They might be at gate 20 and they will come up to me and say like, where's gate 24? I'm like, 20, 22, and 24. So you can imagine getting people to evacuate with part of their plane on fire and saying, hey, get into this grassy area here and stop. They may not follow that instruction because they're just losing their cool. Here's some actual footage from that plane and it's a lot more organized than I would have honestly suspected. All in all, these pilots and don't forget these flight attendants also did an amazing job. Those flight attendants are responsible for everybody that's back there. So they have to keep everybody calm enough and they're having to keep people calm that are sitting on the side of a plane looking at a massive fire on a runway with two engines running. They have to keep everybody calm and communicate with the pilots. So 
not only did the pilots do a good job, and that's the only radio communication we have, but also those flight attendants because they safely got everybody off the plane. Now, I ended up seeing that plane afterwards. I ended up in Chicago. I ended up seeing it. I didn't realize at the time which plane it was, but it had a, a tarp over. I didn't take any pictures of it, obviously, but if I, if I had them, it was sitting there for a while. I'm sure they just used it for parts. But all in all, these pilots, these flight attendants, and honestly, the controller, and I'm guessing the fire and rescue, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but everybody that's on the radio, uh, the pilots and the flight attendants and the controllers all did an amazing job to get all these people off the plane safely. At the end of the day, that's really all that matters. Everybody got off, you can replace a plane. It's hard to replace a couple hundred people. If you enjoyed this video, check out one of these two over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.